Good morning, friends. Good morning. Good morning, church, and welcome to North Olmsted United Methodist. Great to be with you this morning as we lean into this first Sunday in July, this fourth Sunday after Pentecost, this Independence Day weekend. Uh, July 3rd is also significant to me, and I don't know if she's watching online or not, but today is my daughter's birthday. So Terry and I celebrate uh, the July 3rd. She was, two, she was three and a half hours early of being a firecracker. Uh, so, but, but that didn't seem to stop her because she still is, very energetic. And we'll, we'll celebrate our birthdays and anniversaries later and joy in our time of prayer. Do welcome all of you in person and also those that are live streaming with us or watching the service in a recorded way later. As we come to this time, we know that God and Jesus Christ greets us, and so I would offer this welcoming greeting and call and response. The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, and also with you. We do particularly also welcome those that may be searching for our church home. North Olmsted United Methodist truly is. We don't just say that, we live that, a very welcoming place, a very hospitable place, an engaging, joyful, and active place. So we encourage you to try us out. And uh, in addition to worship this morning, we encourage you to contact us through our website at www.noumc.org or call the church office at 440-779-6634. We'd be glad to connect you with more information about the ministries and missions of the church. You do have an announcement sheet in your bulletin and encourage you to look at those, read those, and find ways to participate and to invite others to participate as well. This seems to be becoming an annual event, which I'm really excited, is Putt-Putt with the Pastor, uh, and that's for people of all ages on Thursday, July 21st. You'll see other details regarding timing and location. Don't forget about our murder mystery night. We're bringing that back. I uh, saw some wonderful pictures where that was offered prior to my appointment over three, just about three years ago. So we encourage you to live into that fun and fellowship with Murder Mystery Night on Saturday, July 23rd. Continue to support our Oxcart, pan Oxcart Pantry collections with school supplies until July 31st. You'll see other information pertaining to that ministry. And again, we continue to offer the invitation to provide altar flowers. There are none this morning, but we do have the beautiful floral design as we celebrate Pride Month again, although that was last June. We're always about in every month and every season, including everyone into the life of the church, our LGBTQI brothers and sisters and all into the life of North Olmsted. You'll see a calendar of this week's activities. We don't slow down in the summer. A uh, number of groups, teams, and committees meeting. Keep those folks in your thoughts and prayers. I do have a special announcement to make, which we'll also offer as a joy during our time of prayer. Um, they say, for me, go, saying goodbye is a very, very difficult thing. So I try to say, until next time. Uh, Bill and Marilyn Ransom are with us. Dear, dear couple, individually as a couple, as people in our church family here at North Olmstead. This is their last Sunday. Uh, they will be moving soon to Avon, Indiana to be closer to family and their love and care for one another. Bill, I can't, and Marilyn, I can't say enough about the content and spirit and just who you are and what you've given of your lives in ministry with the church, with the community, people here and beyond. You are loved, you are cared for. We will dearly miss you. And I understand from Bill, you are going to find ways to stay connected, uh, maybe through our live stream Bible studies and other things that we do with technology. And please know, I, I, I know you know this, but we want to say it out loud, know that when you're ever in the area, the doors are always wide open and you're always welcome. After the service, uh, there are some folks in the church, uh, Tammy and others, that have prepared a wonderful reception for Bill and Marilyn over cake and cookies and lemonade and and water. We want, to, we want to be in joy and celebration with you after the service, so I hope all of you will stay for that. I love you. We love you. We care for you. Best to you in this time of transition. May we give them a round of applause.
I, th I thought about calling on your bios and resumes and doing a lot, because I know you're so involved, but um, that will suffice. And I believe there'll be so many good words offered after the service. So as we come to this time of the service to be not only in joy, but to be challenged in friendly ways with the scriptures, the hymnody, the prayers, the response to the word for all that we're about in worship, I encourage you now to center your hearts, your minds, and your spirits as we listen to the prelude. Please stand for the call to worship. And join me. Um, <clears throat> we are called together this day to praise God. We ask that God put us in pathways to service to others. The Lord will walk with us as we faithfully witness to Christ's love. Open our hearts, Lord to receive your words and will. Come, let us worship God. Let us sing our praises to God, our Redeemer and Healer. Amen. Please remain standing for the Old Testament reading. It's from Psalms chapter 66, verses 1 through 9. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Because of your great power, your enemies cringe before you. All the earth worships you. They sing praises to you, sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds among mortals. He turned the sea into dry land. He passed through the river on foot. There we rejoiced in him, who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let the rebellious not exalt themselves. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. 
who has kept us among the living and has not let our feet slip. That's the end of the reading. Please join me in the unison prayer. Gracious God, mend our brokenness and our sadness. Give us spirits of joy and enthusiasm for service to you by serving others. Lift us and place us on your pathways of peace and hope, that with our lives we will witness to your redeeming love. Amen. The first hymn is This Is My Song, found in the United Methodist Hymnal on page 437. It's just a great hymn for not just the United States, but for all our brothers and sisters and all nations as we live in the ideals that can become reality in love and care for everyone in God's world. It's a wonderful hymn. Thank you for choosing it, Marlene. So as we come to this time of prayer, I uh, want to direct your attention to the prayer list. Please pray for these individuals, these couples, these families, not only on this Sunday morning, but throughout the week. It's good to keep this close by side. Maybe make that additional phone call, send that email when you see one another in person. Pray for them and let them know that you're praying for them with those that are listed. 
We want to recognize this week's birthdays with Donald, with Neil, Tammy, Paul, and again, my, our daughter Terry and my daughter Megan. So we welcome one another in joy and celebration for those birthdays this week. I've also received these prayer cards. Out of concern, uh, we are asked to pray for Jan, who is often a guest at our free community meals uh, each month. Uh, she is having removal of cancer, and that surgery will happen on July 6th. She has asked again in the extension of our church family to those in free community meal and everywhere, no boundaries, Jan asks for our prayers. Please keep her in those for safe surgery and recovery. Craig and Pat, uh, this is good news. Uh, Addie, our daughter, with them, her parents, Thanks all of you for your prayers for a successful surgery for Addie. She will go back to work on Tuesday. That's, that's quick. Uh, continued prayers for a negative test on the removal of her thyroids. They decided to do that all at once, and we pray her for strength and health for her in the days ahead. Sally and Will are ready for visitors. You know, they've been busy with uh, attending to Sally's health and Will walking alongside with family and church family helping them. They are uh, welcoming anyone to come and visit them at their new home in Valley of the Falls, room 111. So I'm sure Will and Sally would enjoy your visits. Did I receive all the prayer cards? I want to make sure about that. Um, also want to remind you that we continue to live into the year of invitation with a theme, all invite. Uh, and so I would just in a friendly way ask, how are you doing with that? Uh, are you inviting folks to an event, an activity, to worship? It doesn't have to just be worship, although that's ideal. I know some of you have said you've done that, which is wonderful, uh, as we extend in friendly ways connection into the life of the church. There's a group, and I'd ask that you pray for us on Friday that are getting together with the leadership, training, and direction of Beth Ortiz, Director of Strategic Ministries with the East Ohio Conference of the United Methodist Church. We are journeying together, and the group that will be journeying along with Beth as teacher are Andy, Claudia, Sarah, Craig, and John Voss. So pray for us as we journey in response to two books, Bless Five Everyday Ways to Love Your Neighbor and Change the World, and also creating your own spiritual autobiography, all in the theme of we're doing that, but how can we continue in an ongoing way, even more so, learn about how we can be friendly, hospitable, inviting, and connecting, building on the strength of that church, getting more and more people involved, and how do we do that? How do we share our faith stories? How do we tell about who we are? and invite others to tell them about who they are. So an outcome we pray and we ask your prayers for us will be to then reach out to the larger church family and say, this is what we learned and this is what we would encourage. And hopefully we expand our knowledge and the joy of invitation. So would ask that you pray for us on Friday, July 8th in that learning. As we come to this time of prayer, I would encourage you to center your hearts, your minds and spirits and a time of silence as we then bring our prayers to God. Lord God, O oh, gracious, loving, eternal God, ever-present God, help us to never, ever take for granted the freedoms that you give us to live and to choose to not only experience the freedom for ourselves, but to extend it for others. We thank you for those that have and are and will continue to preserve freedom for us, with us, and through us, and what we know as the United States of America. Lord God, in some ways, we're still a baby country, and we're still learning, and the world is watching. And they're watching, will we extend the same blessings 
that we have received and generations before us for freedom. Freedom for people to come, to live, to have a home, to eat, to have employment, to share in the things that we so benefit from, in education, in medical assistance, in medical care, in security of our lives, bodily, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Lord God, we thank you for the United States of America, even with its blemishes, even with its imperfections, that we might be striving for the good things about our country and that we would offer it for others. Lord God, you are an open, freeing God who knows no boundaries. Help us to embody your life in us, your son in us, to open our hands wide to offer freedom for others. Lord God, we uh, pray for those that are mentioned and listened, listed on our prayer list, for whatever afflicts them, whatever concerns them, for whatever recoveries they are experiencing, bodily, emotionally, spiritually, whatever it is, we call on you that people would be aware of your healing, strength, and awesome presence. Help us embody that as we tend to and walk alongside and sit with and pray with others. Lord God, we know that in life and faith and even ministry, there are times in which we fall short and we strive to be faithful to be faithful and effective through you. And part of that means that, that we understand that we sin and we fall, but that you never let us go. You redeem us and that you're a merciful God. And we know that collectively as we now pray our prayer of confession in unison together. Let us pray. Merciful God, in all our celebration, fireworks, parades, and gatherings, we have proclaimed liberty and freedom, yet our hearts are chained by anger, doubt, terror, and fear. We live in those chains, often not knowing that there is really any other way. We have become accustomed to our imprisonment. Forgive us when we turn away from your freeing love. Help us to place our trust in you and serve you by working with others for peace and hope for all. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Reach out, stretch your spirits. God's love has freed you from oppression and fear. You have been made whole in God's eternal love. We pray all this as Jesus taught his disciples and teaches us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As the Lord God freely gives to us, we freely give back to God. Would the ushers please come forward?
Lord God, we give back freely these gifts that you have freely given to us, that they would be blessed by you through your Son, Jesus Christ, for ministries of freedom, of justice, to house, to clothe, to feed, to educate, to provide health care, and on, and tending to our bodies, minds, and spirits. We know through our commitment and faith to you that through faith and love, you will bless and empower these gifts. We give you all the thanks and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So it's appropriate that we now stand again and join together <laughs> in our hymn, America the Beautiful. <laughs> Again, you may be seated. <laughs> so, thing about worship, we can get our exercise in a lot of ways. It's fun. It's fun. It's a joy. Curiosity and learning, challenge and learning. Wow, I just look forward to every Sunday. Uh, even as I was away, uh, I, I, I work with churches, and I'm committed the same here at North Olmstead that when I have vacation time or continuing time to put folks in good hands. Uh, I don't just go down, oh, there's somebody available. I really give thought to who. And I did see the service and Reverend Lisa Morrison and all those that assisted with her did such a beautiful job in worship. And so I thank you all. Our gospel lesson this morning is from the gospel of Luke. And this is from chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. 16 through 20, we learn of the mission, the commission of the 70, along with the other disciples, what happens in that mission and ministry, and then upon the return. It speaks well to what we are doing directly and indirectly to the year of invitation. Hear these good words. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them on ahead of him in pairs to every town and place 
where he himself intended to go. He said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if anyone is there who shares in peace, your peace will rest on that person. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for the laborer deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Care for and cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. You know this, the kingdom of God has come near. Whoever listens to you listens to me, and whoever rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. See, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of the challenges that I and others have in life is overpacking for a trip or a vacation. Now, you have to see it to believe it, to see if there was any kind of progression with my learning. But over the years, I have learned to pack less, but it hasn't always been that way. As I recall my days of travel to and from college, getting on the Amtrak train in Valparaiso, making my way over to to Ada, getting off and on. And, and I admit that a lot of what I packed in two oversized bulging suitcases was laundry that um, I needed help with. But nevertheless, even with clean clothes, I overpacked. I remember overpacking and some would argue, well, this is natural, not only um, with immediate family, with our children when they were young, you know, with car seats and this, that, and the other, and clothes and, and toys and everything. But often when I, we went out, Terry and I, we, we found ourselves using not even half of that. We overfunctioned on packing. The same would be then for those trips for family reunions each summer with extended family and who's responsible for cooking and this gathering and that gathering and what do we need to bring for our own. We can overanalyze and overpack things when we are going out and about. I learned this in my business travel to cities where I would overdo it, and even in some of my individual getaways in retreat and spiritual renewal. More often than not, I used to pack much more than I needed, and so what was I doing? I remind myself then, and I remind myself now, what was I doing? What am I doing with all that stuff that I really never needed, never need when I am away from home? Perhaps you have some empathy in those experiences for yourselves and others. Now, most recently, Terry and I did a pretty good job. We did well with 
our recent trip to Barcelona and France, we were able to pack in a way that avoided claiming belongings at the baggage claim area. We've never done that before uh, with air travel. And paying more dollars, we avoided that, paying more dollars for additional carry-on luggage and those overhead compartments, you're not sure which angle to put it in and if the wheels go here sideways or out, but you kind of, and, it, and it's always a welcome sign when you hear click uh, when it's finally down. But we did succeed. We did it with each of us having one carry-on bag and one small suitcase that fits safely above those overhead compartments. Yay. Made the trip, the journey, that much more relaxing and peaceful. However, with all this in mind, I confess that my carry-on bag, and I didn't pack it this morning. It would have taken too long to show how I packed it and unpacked it. My backpack, which is about this thin, ended up being swollen to the gills swollen to the threads, and my suitcase as well, to the point that I was afraid that the seams might come loose. I barely had enough room to pack some handmade souvenir dishware from Barcelona on our, our trip to the U.S., you know, rolling things and packing and stuffing and protecting and hoping it doesn't break. Too much stuff. So I was fortunate that there was no breakage and that we weren't stalled somewhere trying to get all our belongings. That all of this and we returned in satisfaction with the most important thing was our very lives and our continual relationship with one another. Now that's something that we need to pack well with ongoing in our marriages, with our significant others, with our immediate extended families. It's the stuff sometimes that gets in the way with travel, work, and business. We need to pack carefully and maybe overflow with what we pack in the goodness of ourselves and with others. Now, I will humor just for a moment, and then we'll move on, that, that, that I did so well at this, this last trip that, that I actually underpacked a little bit. Uh, and this is probably TMI for some folks, but you know me, I can be TMI. Uh, I was a bit short on T-shirts and underwear. But it's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing, and, and Terry reminded me of that, what you can do by washing a few garments in the sink or tub and then letting them dry out overnight in your hotel room. We were fine. God gives us in all ways, in joy and work, creative ways, to pack life, to pack light, and to remember that God will not leave us alone. God will care for our needs and so I'm learning, and I hope you are as well, to travel lighter in your life and faith journeys. The disciples modeled this for us in following the instructions from Jesus. The disciples, devoted followers of Jesus, and 70 others, we understand from Scripture, were instructed, commissioned, and sent forth. This was the extension of not just being a believer and a follower, but to live in action. Sent forth in action as apostles. Not enough to learn and follow, but the apostle title was to live in action with God's goodness and that they were to travel light. I believe that they did, as I've read about other early Christians who traveled light. They did this. They didn't need all the physical stuff that we have. They simply presented themselves with who they are and who God was creating them to be to bring the message, the good news to others. Specifically, Jesus instructed the apostles to go forth in pairs to share the good news of the kingdom of God, and so we're reminded they didn't have to do this alone. And I can't imagine, maybe the homes that they went to provided these items if they didn't have them or if their feet were sore, but to carry no purse, no bag, and no sandals. Wow, now that is traveling light, but again, they didn't have to do it alone. I'm sure beyond scripture, as homes would receive them, they provided for their needs. They went forth trusting in all this. How? Trusting in Jesus, trusting in God, and trusting those who would welcome them. God, Jesus, and others who would receive them. Trusting all of them that their food, drink, and housing, were told, would be provided. That homes would receive them and greetings of peace and opportunities to be cured of sicknesses. The apostles went forth trusting that the Spirit of the living God, the spirit of Jesus, would give them what they needed every step of the way. If there's anything else you remember, or nothing else you remember from you, God will give you what you need for yourself and others. Do not be so worried or consumed with 
things of materialism. Of course, going out and doing all this in this way would be, not be easy for the disciples, the apostles. It would be challenging. As Jesus, we know in Scripture, was rejected and offering the good news of the kingdom, people, and I'll talk about us in a moment, people would say no, would not welcome them, and would turn them away from the life-giving message in God's kingdom. And what is that? God's love, grace, peace, forgiveness, and mercy, and the call to be all that God had created them to be. That's what it meant to be about and bring the good news to others of the kingdom of God. Jesus understood this when he said, I'm sending you out the realities of rejection. I'm sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. That's a scary image. But they did get devoured, at least in words at the time, and some would get devoured again as they martyred their very lives for the gospel. We don't necessarily have to martyr ourselves in today's world, although in some places it does still happen. It's just not readily known in the news. Some would simply not receive the message of goodness and would treat the disciples poorly. However, the disciples, the apostles, were encouraged to remain steadfast and confident in the face of rejection, to wipe off the dust. Okay, I've offered it. That's fine. I respect that. But this is good news that God and Christ have given me to you. and it's, it's your choice to receive it or not. Thank you for the meal, the hospitality, but we do need to be on our way. And then they wipe off the dust and go to another town and another household to see where they might receive it. Jesus said with conviction, which must have gotten their attention and helped them to keep their focus and mission. These are powerful words. Whoever listens to you, to you, and your faith story, and sharing the good news of the gospel, listens to me. And whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. Stern words, firm words, but guiding and reassuring words that they would understand that Jesus knows how difficult this is. Serving as messengers of the good news was certainly challenging for them, but there was great joy, we're told, in Scripture upon their return when the apostles reported to Jesus that they had found people who received and committed their lives in the goodness of the kingdom of God. There was joy when this experience happened to them. There is joy for us when this happens to us. In a simple conversation, a word, a phrase, a golden nugget story about your faith here at the church or beyond and what God and Jesus has done for you. That's what it means to be an apostle. That's what it meant for them to find the joy which will come if we trust God and Jesus. You see, the apostles were commissioned and sent to share the good news because they trusted God. They weren't in fear and saying, oh, but what about my sandals, my purse, my food, and I need a little bit more time with my family before I say goodbye and return. They weren't, they weren't lost in that. They weren't distracted with that. They followed and trust the commission to live in faith, to live in action. To pack with them their faith and trust in God. To unpack their very being, their trust in God and Jesus Christ with others. You see, by doing so, by doing this, they understood that the most important thing that we can carry is our relationship with God, Jesus Christ, and others. That's where it all happens where we discover we don't have too much or too little for God provides. You see, we're called to do all this even though it is very difficult to do so. Joy like the apostles can be experienced by us even during times of rejection. Have you known rejection when you shared your Christian story? Now what's, what's dangerous about asking that question is for myself and others is maybe when you were rejected, you said, not nah, going to go there again. I don't want to jeopardize this friendship, uh, this working relationship, and it's just better if I don't say anything, which is not what God tells us in Jesus Christ to do. 
we are to pursue it with God's timing and in a natural and authentic way. And then when that does happen, there is joy. When you hear the spark of someone listening and then there's conversation about life, faith, and empathy and all of what's going on in the world, you discover this is not going to be a rejection experience. This is going to be an acceptance experience as we walk together in faith. I know, which is almost in and of itself is another sermon. I know the pain and the rewards of this by living with a very, very, very diverse extended family. And, I, and I've dared as a, as a pastor, as, as, a, as a husband, as a brother-in-law, as an uncle, as a great uncle, to have the conversation about my faith. For them to know me in those roles, not, oh, the pastor relative is with us, but to just really meet them where they are. And so there are agnostics in our family. There are atheists. There are people who actively practice in the Jewish tradition. There are people who are exploring exploring things out of Buddhist tradition, secular yet connecting ideas of mindfulness and meditation and world and spirituality, it is all over the map. Now, I am fortunate in those conversations, and I know this is not true with everyone, that almost, I would, yeah, I would say everyone is in the same political camp. So I don't, I don't have the burden that I know that some folks have when they start talking about religion and faith and it gets ugly and weaving around politics, and then, oh no, so and so said, and there's estrangement, and walls go up and guard. The problem is we make it about ourselves and we become defensive. And, 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 and then it's really not about you or me, it's about God and Jesus and the other person working in it, even when it's painful. Because I've, I've had people in the family say, you know, Hoyt, I understand, but I don't want to hear it. And that's fine, and then we find other ways to relate and to converse. And I don't shove it down their throat. I don't tell them that they're absolutely wrong. I don't browbeat them. I can become passionate, and that's the risk in all of that. It's the risk for all of you. When you're in those conversations with family and friends and maybe colleagues of different backgrounds and beliefs, the best that you can do, I believe, is to offer food for thought your experiences without having them to have to swallow it hook, line, and sinker and believe exactly what you will believe because God will handle the entrance of the door, the conversation, and work it out with them. Food for thought in a good news story or word or phrase. Share how you have trusted God and Jesus Christ to do the work and the certainties and uncertainties of doing so. Accept that you will be accepted and rejected. Maybe some of you have already lived that. Again, avoid defensive responses. You know, I could go off in my quiet and say, I can't believe my atheist nephew just trashed me with that. I mean, I was trying to respect what he had to say and his questioning, but man, he really hammered me. And you see, then, then I get consumed in that in those tapes, and I make it about me and not about God and Jesus working in my beautiful nephew's life. Because God works in miraculous ways, in mysterious ways we never know, to bring people into relationship with God and Jesus and others. Engage and re-engage in the conversations you are led to do so. I don't know your stories. And I know there's, there's probably pain in that. And sharing the gospel, the challenge of doing so with friends and family, but keep doing it and know that you're not alone. Share success stories with one another. And why do we need to do this? Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There are so many people who are feeling hopeless, that are in dire need to hear hope, to know hope, to see in reality why it makes a difference to be a Christian, why it makes a difference to go to worship, to be in Bible study and fellowship. There are so many that are yearning for a safe place, a place to learn and grow and their curiosities about God and Jesus, to learn more. Provide the entrance points, provide the avenues. For Jesus says, go on your way, do it, trust in me. How are you doing this? How are you committing yourself to doing this? 
There's a lot written about evangelism, because what we were in part talking about evangelism, the E word, which quite frankly, a lot of the main lines don't like the E word. It's not part of our theology, our experience. We'll let the other guys do that. We'll let the other churches do that. But, you know, we just respect others to come to faith on their own, but we, we don't go with evangelism. But this, I think, is a really pointed, great article writing on the importance of sharing the gospel, the good news. From an unknown author, hear these insights. The author writes, if we are going to be effective in reaching people for Christ, we are going to have to start showing people that we really care. I know you really care. You know you really care. But people won't necessarily naturally find us to know that. We need to go to them. We need to find ways to go to them. For evangelism means reaching people with the good news of God and Jesus Christ. And missions must be, here's the key word again, must be relational in nature. And not prescribed in a book, or this person did it this way, but just bring yourself naturally into those conversations, even when they're challenging. The author says there is no record of Jesus walking up to someone out of the clear blue sky and saying, I am the Messiah, and then him beginning to show his care for them. No, he always started with care and listening, friendly challenges. No, he showed again his care for them first, and then he revealed himself to them. The author continues, a story is told about a man who was on a luxury liner, and suddenly... He falls overboard. He can't swim, and in desperation, he begins calling for help. Now, it just so happens that there were several would-be rescuers on deck who witnessed the incident. The first man was a moralist. Think about the role that you're going to play in evangelism and discipleship and sharing the good news. The first man was a moralist. When he saw the man fall overboard, he immediately reached out his briefcase and pulled out a book on how to swim. He now tossed it to him and he yelled, Now, brother, you read that and just follow the instructions and you will be all right. The man next to him happened to be an idealist. When he saw the man fall overboard, he immediately jumped into the water and began swimming all around the drowning man, saying, Now, just watch me swim. Do as I do and you will be all right. The person next to him happened to be a member of the institutional church. He looked upon the drowning man's flight and with deep concern, he yelled out, now just hold on, friend. Here, help is on the way. We are going to, <laughs> we are going to establish a committee and dialogue your problem. <laughs> oh, gosh, I love committees. I hate committees. All of their, we, we do well here with those. We're starting to make them action-oriented committees, not FYI. That's a food, that's a, a asterisk. We're, we're becoming more and more effective with our meetings. And then if we have to come up with the proper financing, we will resolve your dilemma. This committee is going to have the answer. Well, that isn't it. The author continues, the next man on deck happened to be a representative of the School of Positive Thinking. He yelled out to the drowning man, friend, this situation is not nearly as bad as you think. Think dry. (laughs) The next man on board happened to be a revivalist. By this time, the drowning man was going down for the third time and deeper and deeper and desperately beginning to wave his arms. Seeing that, the revivalist yelled out, Yes, brother, I see your hands. Is there another? (laughs) Is there another out there? And finally, the last man on deck was a realist. He immediately, and here's the key word, plunged. Plunged into the water at the risk of his own life and then pulled the victim to safety. That's about authentic, helpful, real relationships. With God and Jesus Christ giving us the power to do so. The author concludes, my friends, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We need realists in the church 
willing to plunge into the water and go to work. And so let's be real about this. I believe God and Jesus need you. God and Jesus need me. We need God and Jesus. It's relational. God and Jesus need you. We need them to be workers, to plunge in and do the work, to plunge in and do the work as realists, to overcome our fears with the E word, evangelism, and do the real, genuine, authentic, joyful, and yes, challenging but rewarding work of sharing the good news of the love of God and Jesus in a world that so desperately needs to hear about it from each one of us. Now, let me be so bold to say there are people that have a more natural gift of evangelism, but all of us have the gift in some way or another to share our faith story. So it is, my friends, let me be bold about this, it is an excuse for a person to say, I'm not that kind of person. Someone else may be, but I'm not. So I will hold my cards close to my chest. Find a way to open the deck, open the packing in your own way, even with one person in quiet, uninterrupted conversation, because we need to go to others and not expect that they will always come to us. It is true, if you build it, in some ways they will come, but it's only part of the story. We need to go to others. I offer this very brief story in closing. A young salesman was disappointed about losing a big sale. And as he talked with his sales manager, he lamented, well, I guess it just proves you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. The manager replied, son, take my advice. Your job is not to make him drink. Your job is to make him thirsty. So it is with evangelism. So it is with sharing the good news. With Christ, that others develop a thirst for the gospel. In response, my friends, I would add this. My friendly challenge for each one of you is how will you live your life of faith in ways that make others thirst to know and have a relationship with the love of God, Jesus Christ, and fellow believers? Here and beyond this house of God, how will you do that today as you leave the parking lot and as you go out into the world, how will you trust God to work through you? Travel lightly with the physical stuff. Travel abundantly and overflowing with the spiritual stuff. In the love of God and Jesus Christ. Amen. In the gift of our time together, I invite you to participate with me in the Holy Sacrament of Holy Communion. Please join me in the call and response. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you. God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection. You gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit.
On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice and union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. The table of our Lord is an open table for all. So as we prepare to receive the bread, I also want to offer that towards the middle of each tray is gluten-free wafer for those that are sensitive to gluten. And we also have prepackaged cups as we will receive the cup soon for those that have sensitivities with their health. Let us receive the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ, which is given, which is broken for you. Take, eat, and be made whole.
This is the blood of Christ which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all sins. Take, drink, and be forgiven. Let us stand and join together in our closing hymn.
Go now commissioned, sent by God and Jesus Christ to offer love, to offer peace, to offer hope. Amen. Please be seated as we listen to the postlude.